uh, Danielle Feinberg. Uh, I work at Pixar Animation Studios. I'm a visual effects supervisor. How did you start your career in animation? I studied computer science in college and in my third year took a computer graphics class and learned all about the programming behind graphics basically. But one day the professor turned out the lights and played this computer animation and it well, I think it was the first computer animation we had probably ever seen. Maybe there was a little bit in commercials on TV, but, um, and I just fell in love with it. Thought, oh, that's what I have to do with my life. It just, it felt very magical to be able to create worlds and um, characters and tell stories, but also the idea that you could take this computer that's zeros and ones and writing code and what could come out of it is animation or a whole new world. I don't know, it was just, everything about it was very magical to me. And um, I graduated and about six months after that applied to Pixar um, for a very kind of entry-level technical position in rendering and uh, worked on my first movie was A Bug's Life, so Pixar's second feature film. You worked as director of photography for lighting in Wally, -E, Brave, Coco and visual effects supervisor in Turning Red. What is the difference between the two roles? Great question. Um, you know, as a lighting DP, I was helping craft every frame of the movie in, in sitting down with each lighter and directing their lighting and um, talking with the director a lot to see what they wanted and getting really into the, the deepest parts of what the look of the film should be. And I love that. And also the strategy of how you're gonna get all the lighting done because we're usually are at the end and so any deadlines missed earlier we have to make up for. As the VFX soup, I got to do sort of more technical stuff than I had been able to as a lighting DP, so getting to use that part of my brain more. A lot of strategy about how to get the movie done, which I love. And still some of the creative, especially because Red was trying to find a new kind of style to the film, and a lot of that becomes creative and some of the technical of how to execute that. Um, but it was really interesting to be on the leadership team of the movie so that some of the things I maybe had struggled with on previous movies, I then was in a position to do something about that and do it differently. And so I th found that very empowering and mm -hmm. satisfying. I loved being able to have a little more tech to add to the art. I definitely missed how much creativity filled my day as a DP and how much influence I had over the whole film. As a VFX soup on Red, it's, I think it'll change every movie, but on Red, um, some of it became more about um, how to get the movie done and um, some of the technical and a little bit of creative and so it was a mix I loved but I just I missed having as much creative as I've had in the past so but you get to trade one thing for another so so it was great. Any other roles you would like to try? Maybe director? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm already starting on another film as VFX Soup I'm really excited about that it's always fun to do it once where you're like everything's new and then you get to do it again and you know feel like okay I didn't do it the way I wanted on th that film so now I can change and do better at it. Um, I don't look too far ahead because these different opportunities sort of present themselves and go for that but being a director at Pixar is no joke. It's a very very hard job and so it's not anything that I've ever been like my ultimate goal or something. Um, I really I really love being kind of in the mix and and being able to um, have influence over people's experience on the film and and directly what we can build, bring to the screen and in what way. Um, so I kind of love being in the mix like that, I think. Like many Pixar films, Turning Red had a lot of technological challenges. Can you tell us about the work beyond the panda fur? Yeah, the panda was definitely a big thing where you have a, a big furry creature that um, has to do a lot of emotional acting and a lot of action type stuff, um, which means you need sort of a full range of, of animation capabilities and then you put fur on that and if you've done anything not quite right, the fur will show it because it will be all kind of off. That was definitely a challenge. I think we've come a long way and that that was not even the biggest challenge on the movie, so that's great. It was introduced that we had this giant panda then and the question was, well, if it's a giant panda, can you just scale the hair up or does it look like creepy big tubes of hair then when, because of course it wasn't just that we had a giant panda, we had a giant panda had the little panda crawling up and grabbing onto the hair. So there were definitely some tricks to that in terms of from far away, we scale up the hair so you don't have 
a hundred million hairs or something absurd. And then um, when we're close up, we maybe do what we'd call like a stunt arm. So it's just an arm that has a bunch of hair. So you aren't multiplying the hair over the whole beast. So all of those were challenges. There was huge simulation challenges in that you have a hair, hairy character, then they added seven more pandas. Then you have a, a hairy character climbing on a hairy character and there's all this hugging and touching and messing with hair and being rolling on a bed and a comforter. There's just like an insane amount of simulation that I think initially we didn't even realize how hard that part was gonna be because it was just almost in every shot. And this a sort of regular shot on the movie was much harder than a, another kind of movie, but sort of deceptively so. Animation would add in a hug or a touch or whatever. The biggest challenge I think was um, we were trying to to sort of do something that looked different than some of the films Pixar's done and have a different style and have it inspired by anime and video games a little bit. And so those art forms are very much 2D graphic kind of art forms. And our worlds are very, we've, we've worked so hard over the years to make them very dimensional and have a ton of detail in them because that lends to the richness and some of the realism. And we're not ever going for realism, but we're trying to make things sort of believable and rich. And so, the, it was really not obvious in the beginning how to marry those two things. And so it was definitely a process to figure out how to blend those two things into kind of a new thing. What process do you follow at Pixar for planning work and solving challenges of a film? Yeah, um, you know, initially what, we're talking to the director, trying to find out what their inspirations are. You delve deeply into what is the story. The only thing that's hard is that we continue to work on the story as we go. And so the story can change quite a lot over that time period. So you can't just plan for that. You know, it isn't like you get on the film, that's the story, you plan for that. It's you get on the film, that's the story at that time. And you loosely figure out what you need. And as you get closer and closer to really going hard at it and hitting crunch time, you know that that's more the film and that you have everything in place to do it. So initially you do some loose planning and then as the story starts to become clear exactly what it is you're doing, you can do more sort of concrete planning. And you're understanding what the director's um, sort of visual inspiration is for the movie, um, which a lot of times maybe is live action, other live action films or some art reference or various things. You have to you know, mind melds kind of with the production designer who's designing the, you know, in the head of the art department designing everything in the film so that you can kind of be a cohesive unit in bringing it to the screen. So, and then from there, we just start trying to figure out what either in camera or lighting is the best way we can use our craft to help tell that story and support the story. And so there's all kinds of ways we do that. One of them is like a color script. So we're planning out the whole film where we maybe graph, the, literally graph the emotions of the main character and then take maybe a frame from each um, scene in the movie sequence and put it up and look at it and sort of make sure that where you have super emotional moments, you can, the, the audience can feel that impact. If you um, have something that's a more depressing scene that they can feel that and so that you can kind of map the visuals to the, the emotion you're trying to hit with the story. Can you tell us about the new Profile Movers technology adopted in Turning Red? So it was really cool. Um, around the time I got the visual effects supervisor role on Red, on Turning Red, I went to this um, technical director breakfast, we call it. And so every maybe six months we have one um, and people present the cool stuff they're doing on future movies or sometimes people have side projects they're doing. And this guy, Bill Scheffler, who's one of our longtime riggers, presented about profile movers. And the idea is that instead of the traditional point weighting system of rigging where you're pulling points around to get something to look right, you kind of do the initial pass and then you're finessing it and you do that over and over for different, all the different controls. In this case, you put a series of curves onto the character. The computer then solves where the points should go to hit these profiles. Um, and so what it means is the rigger and the animators can think about what shape they want the character to hit and the computer does the hard work of kind of getting the points in the right place. And it layers on top of, a, of your regular rigging system, so it isn't like you're choosing one or the other. Uh, and it made a huge difference on the film, I think, and we used, we used it for the pandas and it was really great. And now it's, it's getting used on all the future films. But it, to me, was this very clear win in terms of it's how people are thinking about what they're doing anyways, is what the silhouette is or what shape they're trying to hit. 
And so if you could get the computer to do that hard work to figure out where the point should go, then, then how could you not do that? And there's some very brilliant stuff going on in there to get the points to do the right thing based on this curve. It's not, it's not a simple thing. But uh, between Bill Scheffler and Fernando de Goa and Kurt Flesher, those two guys are in our R&D group. They figured out a way to do this whole thing, and it's pretty phenomenal. Unlike other studio films that are rich in detail and have a more photorealistic style, Turning Red has a more graphic style. How were the materials made? It was, we got to a certain point where it felt like we were figuring out the style of, say, the animation and some of the modeling and set dressing. Because it was, somehow that aesthetic was easier to come to of like, the director described it as chunky cute. And so if you're modeling something, it's easy to change the proportions to get to that. It, it was a more direct one-to-one -one thing of what does chunky cute mean? And in set dressing it was, because color was very important on this film, we used repetitive shapes and then clusters of color. Um, and so that, we already kind of knew that's what we were doing in some regards. But it became really not obvious in materials because part of materials, one of the goals is to get a lot of detail and that's how we get the richness. And so how do you get more graphic and stylized with that when it's sort of the antithesis? When we tried to just pull back on things, it looked pretty simple and it didn't look, it just looked like we almost hadn't done the work. And so that was not gonna work. And so there was, there was a little moment in there where I felt kind of worried that, well, where, where is the in-between and can we find it? And um, we had Eric Andreos, who's one of our fabulous shading um, artists, come on and, and he started playing with it and started figuring out with our, we have this, this art director who was, um, they were kind of worked together and, you know, he took some of what the art director had done for a, a kind of a shading guide and then he brought his expertise to it. And pretty soon it was, okay, we have a more limited range of materials so that there's not a lot of shininess to things or specular. And then where you wanted to punch out details, you got more shiny. Um, but the range was, was smaller and we changed which specular model we were using so it, it had a less realistic and more kind of artistic look to it wherever there was shine. And then there was, I think the most important thing was the textures became stylized. And so instead of a lot of stuff that looks like dirt on something that you would apply, it was more like kind of almost paint splotches and looked, the passes looked more bubbly and rounded and more cute. And so you still got that richness, but the shapes of it were different and maybe how kind of small and detailed and repetitive were different, but it still managed to get a lot of that richness in there. But then of course with all these movies, there's things you have to make an exception for and it turned out the food was a, was a big one because you really, putting food in a movie that doesn't look appealing is not a good thing to do. And we learned a lot about how to make food look appealing on Ratatouille and so taking some of that knowledge, some of, you know, a big part of that is the specular, the shininess of it. And so for the food, they kind of backed off on some of that stuff to make it look really appealing but still kind of tried to simplify it a little bit, um, make it a little more graphic than it would have been normally. So, but it was kind of pushed, it went maybe halfway back. How was the look of the visual effects achieved in the film? Some part of it was, you know, effects are so physics driven um, and this very sort of real world math going into it, um, that it can be quite hard to stylize them, especially because if you get the movement wrong, it can really, um, it can really pull the audience out of it or not feel believable. So some amount of the early experimentation was about how to do some stylized effects. And so, for example, when May um, turns into the panda, there's these pink poofs. And so thinking about those more as cotton and what would cotton do, say, like if you were doing a stop motion film, how would you do this? And then using that more as what you would do in Houdini. Um, and they got some really cool stuff that felt um, it didn't feel real world, it felt stylized, um, but still had this believable motion to it. And then the other thing, and, and they did that with incense smoke and all kinds of stuff, like they were figuring out the different ways to do that. But the other element they brought to things was, um, you know in anime there's a lot of these sort of punches of graphic images when there's action. And so um, our effects supervisor, Dave Hale, felt like it was important to roll that into things. And I kept thinking, how is he gonna do that? Like the super effectsy, like, um, you know, based on real life physics to some extent, and these 2D hand-drawn, like very graphic elements. 
<clears throat> but it was very cool because through some, you know, you gotta get the right timing, you gotta use it in the right place, and some great compositing, they pulled it off. And I think that the little extra special sauce on it was that we wrote some code that took those graphic elements to turn them into 3D objects in Houdini that the effects artists could then use, but also then it could go to lighting and they could make a mesh light in RenderMan that then generated light from what were these 2D hand-drawn elements, these graphic elements. And so instead of getting some generic lighting, you, it actually helped to feel them embedded in the scene, even though your eye knew it was this sort of 2D graphic element. So, um, you know, there's all these pieces coming together, as always in these films, to bring it. Um, but that one was one that I, I was sort of dubious about at first, whether it would work. And then there's some of my favorite shots in the movie now. Recently, some films have adopted a stylized look such as Spider-Verse, The Bad Guys, Luca, and Turning Red. What do you think of this new direction in animated movies? I mean, I think it's really cool that over, the, over my career we went from working really hard to make stuff that looked believable, which meant going closer and closer to realism to get the believability, that now we've clearly crossed some kind of threshold, that now what people are excited about is finding different styles with it. So it's just this complete expansion of of the sort of artistic tool set and what you can put together. And so it also just means that it feels like we really truly can tell any story now and um, we can elicit more emotion by hitting these different styles. So it's, I think it's all really exciting and, and it will just continue to push the boundaries of um, what's visually possible and storytelling and I'm sure we'll find some unique ways. What is your personal definition of animation? Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, I guess for me, the thing that attracted me to computer animation was that the world and characters were entirely fabricated. Because at the time, I knew about visual effects in movies, but that felt like someone was shooting a bunch of live action stuff and then you were matching that. But the idea of creating an entire world, and it was anything you could imagine, back then it wasn't really, because there's plenty of stuff you couldn't do, but now for sure. Um, that to me was the thing that I think really drew me to animation versus something like visual effects. Um, so I suppose for me, whether it's technically correct or not, it's about these completely fabricated worlds that you can set characters in and tell stories. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Thank you.